Okay, uh, I, I want to shift to another topic here, uh, some controversy at the Heritage Committee this morning, uh, where Conservative MP Rachel Thomas asked the Heritage Minister, Pascal Saint-Ange, to speak English in her responses. Here's how that went down and the backlash that followed. Minister, I, I noticed that you answer my questions in French, but other English questions you answer in English if they're from your Liberal colleagues. Um, I realize it's completely your choice. We're a bilingual country. Um, but if at all possible, I would, I'd love to have it. Point of order. I thought it was really inappropriate and disrespectful to French people and Quebec people. I am an English Canadian. Therefore, I am somewhat superior to you. You should speak English to me. Okay, several hours later, Rachel Thomas sent this apology to the committee chair, writing, Conservatives support official bilingualism, the preservation of the French language in Canada, and the right of Canadians to communicate in the language of their choice. I would ask that you please pass along my apologies to the minister and to the other members of the committee. Uh, Emily, I, I'm going to stick with you uh, on this a, yeah. as our resident uh, Quebec resident. Um, a lot of Quebec MPs jumped on this today. At one point, Pablo Rodriguez stood up in question period after Pierre Paul, who spoke French, and congratulated him on his bravery in speaking in French, <laughs> given uh, the caucus he is in. Uh, so it's been given the Liberals uh, an opportunity to push back. How do you think this is going to play in Quebec? Well, it's really uh, interesting to have those two segments uh, one after the other because then I have to explain another pre-existing narrative. Okay, <laughs> let's society, go. Uh, which is uh, that, um, and f the clip you played from François Blanchet it was an example of that. He was essentially making a caricature of that, but how for many years you had uh, WASP elites, and especially in Montreal, but who would tell French Canadian workers essentially speak white, uh, which which means speak English to me, speak the proper way. And so that's the, I guess, the French Canadian trauma uh, that plays into how that comment, which might be coming from a very, very different place, is received and why it's creating so much emotional, you know, reaction, both from the political class and the way that it can, you know, re uh, you know resonate with people or not. And so people are having, uh, you know, people are being offended. Uh, and there is obviously issues in terms of how official language uh, act and how that that plays out in Parliament or not, and how uh, it's much easier to be an uh, English-speaking only uh, MP than a French-speaking uh, only MP uh, in, in Parliament, and that the way that bilingualism seems to work in this country often seems to rely on francophones to be doing the bulk of the job. And so all those frustrations are what is behind the emotional reaction that you're seeing today. You cannot understand what's going on in the, the House and why people are being so... Um, once again, strongly worded about this if you don't understand the historical right. context this is coming from. Fred, Fred, as I was watching this unfold today, it seemed to me there was a more base tactical thing at play uh, at the committee in that Rachel Thomas wanted Pascal St. Ange to speak to her in English so she could get clips to put on social media, and Pascal St. Ange was not going to speak to her in English to deny her the clips to right. go on social media. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Rachel Thomas is typically a very strong communicator in pushing messages and getting them out there, and this is how she does a lot of this through committees, so she was attempting to do that. Uh, and the minister was, uh, of course, not allowing her to do that, which is her right to do. And uh, you know, when Minister, when Miss Thomas, Miss Thomas made those comments, uh, you know, I don't. She wasn't trying to be offensive, but she obviously offended a lot of people, and it is going to hurt. It's going to. I think there's going to be a political price to pay for that. Um, How? With whom? Well, with Quebecers and francophones across the country, not just in Quebec. It's uh, when you, you know, as, uh, as Emily said, this is something that's very sensitive to people and for good reason. Uh, a lot of people have to fight for their uh, their rights and their languages. They're a minority in this country, uh, and this is something that um, that people will see this and uh, they're going to get riled up by it. So, Priya, uh, what's your sense of how this all unfolded here today? Yeah, I mean, I would say off the top that it's not often that politicians apologize and recognize their mistakes. Um, and certainly, you know, last week with Mr. Polyev, we saw that they don't see conservatives generally don't seem to be too big on apologizing right now. So I think it's a good thing that Rachel Thomas apologized full stop. OK, but I think we also need to recognize that francophones in this country have to deal with this sort of thing all the time and it's incredibly unfair in, in any time you have a group of like bilingual anglophones or bilingual francophones um the bilingual anglophones will all speak english and then the bilingual francophone has to often also then adjust to 
speaking English, and it never really goes the other way. Um, Minister saint Ange is, of course, capable of speaking English. Um, mm. and we know this. But it's also completely understandable why she, or anyone for that matter, would want to answer questions in a formal setting, particularly in a politically partisan, charged, somewhat adversarial setting. Um, you'd want to answer the questions that, you know, in the language that you're most comfortable in. Like, for myself, I speak French. Um, and if I had to answer questions in any formal setting and not just in conversations with people that I know, I would definitely prefer to speak in English. And I grew up in Granby and went to University of Montreal for law school. So, like, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, like, whether or not you can actually speak the language. It's just that, you, you know, at, and to, to Fred's point, you, Rachel was also probably angling for for clips. Um, and there is something to be said about uh, tactically sort of denying that. Or sorry, Dave, you had said that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think all in all, I, I, you know, it's good that she apologized. It's it's a disappointing that it had to have happened to begin with. Um, and I'm curious to see how this plays out uh, in the next couple of days. Andrew, what's your read? Yeah, I think obviously what's been said is, is fair comment. It was a uh, a curious comment. She should have recognized that that's not something you say in a parliamentary committee. Uh, and certainly there's no need for a uh, uh, predominantly francophone uh, minister to have to respond in English. I think that, you know, we, uh, Emily and I could certainly compare notes on, you know, the cultures we grew up in. There's certainly a, a sense in Western Canada bilingualism has shut the West out uh, of the corridors of power, that there are kind of, you know, a unilingual francophone population, a unilingual anglophone population ruled by a bilingual elite in the country. But those are things that you say on Coffee Road, they're not things you say in the halls of Parliament. And I think that that's the mistake that the Conservatives ha have made, and it will, uh, I have absolutely no doubt, affect them when they are trying to build their, uh, their support in Quebec. Mm. Uh, Atlantic Canada says hello on that conversation, uh, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, Emily, to go back to, to Fred's point, where he thinks this, there's going to be a cost here, uh, potentially, in Quebec with Quebecers, uh, they moved to shut this down pretty quick, right? Because initially a committee, there was not an apology that it, it turned into the usual sort of committee fighting and it was a little bit like the process with the Ken Hardy tweet from earlier in the week where he tweeted it, stood by it, spoke to Karina Gould and then swallowed his tweet whole. It was Rachel Thomas sort of saying it, defending it at committee and then a while later a written apology uh, coming out. So there's definitely a sensitivity to this it seems uh, in, in the party structure. Will the cost be real or is it just uh, have they moved quickly enough to shut it down? Uh, it depends if this is just a mistake by one MP or if it makes people want to pay attention and ask questions to Pierre Poilievre in terms of what are their language, their actual, you know, views and policies on official bilingualism in Canada. There's a view of francophone minorities, not Quebecers, francophone minorities across the country uh, that uh, when the Conservatives are in power, there's a lot of cuts to francophone institutions in other provinces including your Atlantic Canada, David, especially in New Brunswick, it's been hard <laughs> under conservative governments. And so there, there, there's going to be questions, I think, asked maybe to Pierre Poilievre as a follow-up on this, okay, well, where do you actually stand on the French language in general um, and their policy? And if that's the case, then the story is not over. Right. So, Fred, uh, the apology came out, but what I found interesting about the apology, it was sent to the clerk or the committee chair, wasn't sent to the minister, was done in writing, wasn't, you could have written on a point of order, you could have called the minister, you could have emailed the minister, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, it was a committee uh, incident that happened. It's where it took place. It actually makes sense to send it to the committee chair, who can then distribute it to all the, the members there. Because you've got to recall, um, when she, when Ms. Thomas made these remarks, all of the other parties raised points of order, and there was heated debate. Sure was. Uh, and then she made the remarks again, so she actually did it twice. Um, and there's more points of order. So uh, this is where this happened. So it makes sense to me that it went to the chair uh, and not directly to the minister there. You know, Sapria, beyond this one incident, right, this is something we're seeing a lot at committees um, in that it, it turns into clip hunting uh, uh, exercises by a lot of the parties, right, by the liberals and the conservatives in a lot of ways, right? If it's a liberal minister there, it's softball questions designed to get something that gets put out, and, and then it becomes the aggressive tack trying to provoke sort of a response uh, from the opposition. And the purpose of them they're not really being met. It seems like everything right now, um, to some degree, has become a, a purely partisan exercise and policy is completely falling by the wayside. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. Like, there's no other way to say it. I, I, I mean, at these clips, you, you know, uh, it, they try and garner these clips so that they can appeal to their most rabid partisan fanatics online. Um, maybe they can 
get some fundraising out of it, sort of. But I think generally when you're um, – a lot of the most important work is supposed to happen at committee and does happen at committee. And it's a shame that um, parties of virtually every stripe end up turning, um, you know, these committees into nothing but a clip generation um, for their own purposes. I, I think Canadians would be better served um, if politicians actually were focused on getting to better policy solutions for the country um, instead of just trying to dunk on one another um, by these little snippets of, of video that they end up putting up. Andrew, do you think this is just what we have to live with until the next election, and, and I, which I think is going to go probably the full two years because uh, it's a Polyev majority if it happens anytime soon, and that does not suit Mr. Blanchet, Mr. Singh, or Mr. Trudeau in any shape or form. Do you think it's just going to be two years of this sort of partisanship? Why just two years? It'll be 20 years of this. <laughs> I mean, it'll just the parties switch switch positions, and you know there's a different different set of targets. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the piece that you know for all that, that's been said about it that I think is is interesting, and one of the, the problems is. You know, it goes back to what we've talked about in past weeks about the Conservatives really are auditioning now to be the national government, to, to assume those uh, positions of power, and they're needing to put forward people that look like they could form a front bench. These types of mistakes are kind of silly, that cheap partisanship that Sapria talks about it makes it, uh, you know, just look like they're not quite ready. And I think that that's something that, uh, as the Conservatives come out of this session, think about as they go into the next one, uh, whether that tone and tenor needs to change to suit what, what the positions are that they're actually seeking. Fred, Fred, do you think they see this as, as a problem right now, the Conservatives? Like, or, you know, because uh, the polls aren't showing any damage, you know, and public opinion polls two years before an election are public opinion polls two years before an election. Mm -hmm. But they do tell you something, and, um, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to show that, at least in the short term, since a couple of incidents have happened, that's had any real effect on Mr. Polyev and his numbers. Right, not yet anyway, as things go. I mean, these incidents are happening now. Um, it takes time for those to set in, and, and they have to accumulate. Um, when it comes to political campaigns, I always say uh, whatever campaign team uh, has the least amount of mistakes usually wins. Uh, so that's when these things can add up, though. So we have to see how this, how this unfolds and uh, if they're able to clamp down on this stuff. Emily, you've seen any stir from today uh, in Quebec? Uh, I, I've not seen anything from Premier Legault or the PQ leader or anything like that. I, I mean, is, is this having any resonance or is what happened, you know, with Ms. Thomas and, and Pascal St. Ange here today uh, an Ottawa bubble thing? Uh, it could be, it could stay in Ottawa bu bubble thing because there is so many other things uh, going on in Quebec. There is a ongoing strike of basically everybody right. in the public sector. Uh, that's the top news here. And so I think if it wasn't for that, there'd be more energy, uh, politically speaking, to invest uh, into what's happening in Ottawa. But with that uh, and uh, some bill that basically some stuff on the housing crisis as well, I think people had their heads sold today. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways. No, uh, I, I mean, certainly the labor disruption in Quebec is, is an absolutely dominant yeah. thing. Uh, Supriya, one other point just to touch on uh, before we say goodbye, like th this partisanship, the sort of the, 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 the tough toxicity kind of culture here in, in this town. Uh, we were having a discussion about this earlier in the week. Um, maybe COVID has made it worse, but there was a time in Ottawa uh, where journalists hung out with politicians after work and saw them in restaurants and saw them in bars and they had a conversation and par MPs did this across party lines. And that has largely gone away uh, in this town and a hardened posture has sort of taken root uh, on both sides. Um, what, what do you make of that sort of trend, you know, in, in politics and what it's done to the conversation, the debate and the ability to just see people as human beings across the aisle? So I think it's made all of those things worse. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, I wouldn't liken it to COVID, actually, um, although that, that's possibly a plausible explanation. But I think a more um, accurate uh, assessment would be the way social media works. And if you look at some of these, you know, larger social media platforms, whether we're talking about uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, I mean, those algorithms are designed to engage you. And mm. guess what engages you? Um, rage. Um, and so it, the political parties have clearly figured this out. Um, and they're just constantly serving up rage um, uh, because it gets their partisan folks engaged. It gets them to open up their pocketbooks and donate money um, while at the same time corroding uh, our democracy and the 
and like you said, I think what it fundamentally comes down to is being able to see the other side, if you will, or, or your colleagues um, as actual people. And this has real impacts in terms of like effective polarization. Um, in in terms, and what that means is, it's not just like effective polarization means that you, you're you're looking at somebody and you're othering them right away, and you don't like them because they are you know of party X and you're of party Y. Um, we're seeing the, that you know become hardened, and, and that's a really bad thing. And I don't think any reasonable person um, wants our country to go in that direction. But I, I don't know what we do um, mm. otherwise. All right, King. Uh, interesting conversation, Apreet. And Emily, thank you for explaining the various narratives of Quebec uh, to this Anglophone boy uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you very much. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you uh, very much to the power panel. So, Apreet, Avedi, Fred Delory, Andrew Thompson, and Emily Nicola. I'm Fred. I'll see you tomorrow for the Political Pulse panel. Sounds Thanks, good. King.